welcome to the next presentation. We have here with us uh, Marian Zeiss and Peter Müsig, and we moderators were asked to introduce our uh, speakers um, and explain what their contribution to the UI5 world is. So Marian is well known also from last year for the best of UI5 project and for several very interesting blog posts, for example, regarding our topic today, the Excel upload. And Peter Müsig, our Peter, what is your contribution okay. to UI5? Cool. Let's say besides UI5. So Peter, as our main architect, chief architect, is from the very beginning the UI5 man. So you are so you are today our in the UI5 world the, the this keyword. That's Peter. And <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, please welcome Marian and Peter for the very interesting topic about the Excel upload. You know, our customers uh, love Excel and Excel import, export, integration uh, in every every kind, possible kind. So we are very curious to hear how to do the Excel upload in an easy way. And it's actually a perfect introduction because the, the first topic I actually going to talk about, like where did the idea, the idea come from? And I already heard some participants. Yeah, we have the same requirement. Uh, just before I start, that's the agenda. First, the use case that it show a live demo how to actually set it up. And um, because we're in a dev developer conference, I don't really go into much detail what the actual features are. Uh, I'm gonna go, go more into detail what actually the setup is like what do i use as a as a basis like i use the component how do i do testing how to do a deployment version namespace and it's a title as well why do i use um, open source so let's start with the use case um i currently i'm just i'm an independent developer so i have several customers and one customer a customer was a utilities company and they had this well-known use case we have excel files i want to upload them from this use case, that they were coming from the external side. So Excel file needs to go somehow into the SAP uh, system. Um, the first thing we, we thought about was, OK, open source, how to, to use uh, Excel files. There's this well-known open source project uh, called ABAP2 XLSX. So that would be like uh, upload the binary to the back end and read out the data from the Excel file and then save them to the to the ABAP system or the database. Um, there would be an approach, but we're currently in transformation to S4. So we have the tools of Fury Elements and RUB as a backend um, system. So we, we would like to use that um, and make them like a more universal approach to cover more system because it's when you're in a transformation, you have a diverse landscape of systems, not just S4, but all the systems with like the maintenance version 171 as well. So that's what that was our approach to have a more universal way to do that. And then we had the idea to move this extraction of the data to the front end. And we used a, a other library called Sheet.js. And what that actually does is the same way of up to XLSX. We upload the data in the front end, extract the data, and then use the standard APIs from UR5 to send the data in the back end. That's the big advantage is we don't care about the back end, what the back end is. Could be CUP, RUB, SAT, W, whatever you could use. Uh, you could use that. So that's how we have a like a more universal approach. And then because it's a common use case we wanted to integrate as easy as possible uh, for the developers. So I think the best way to do that, to show how easy it is to use, is using a live demo. So I have a cup, a local cup uh, running in the background. Um, and I use what you probably always use when you generate a new Fury app. The Fury Elements app is the, the Fury generator. I really just want to like um, generate a really basic app. I have a few um, annotations in the background, but really just basic annotations to show the data. So there's an orders entity and a navigation entity is order items. And just that, and I want to use 108. It works with uh, 100, the newest one as well, just to make sure it works. Uh, nothing special. Uh, Otherwise, and 
it's just now it's just a standard Fury Element uh, app. If you go in there, there's no custom code, nothing basically. So and just have a bit a preview, and I think you all know how a Fury Elements app uh, is look like. Um, we have here the orders, orders items, shipping details. I have some some sample data here, and now. I would like to use the Excel upload. So as I said, I wanted to make it easy as possible. And I use the same approach as the Fourier tools and the easy UI5 is to use the Yeoman generator. So I just use Yo, use my generator. I have a few options like what kind of deployment, a little bit bigger. What kind of deployment? Because uh, the basis is a component, so similar to a library, I could deploy that to the app system. Um, so you have two options: ship the component with the app or use it from the uh, central system. Uh, currently, for demo, I want to uh, use it uh, in app. Then, where to add the button to upload? So basically, which uh, entity I want to to use, like orders or the items. We start with the list report. So orders, uh, just the button text, and before I do that, I actually want to show you uh, what changes. So I just in it quickly a, a Git repo. And then that's it. Now it's integrated. So we can have a look. So what actually changed? Let's start with the package JSON. Uh, again, easy as, uh, easy as possible to use. So I deployed it to npm JS. So you can just use npm install UR5CC uh, spreadsheet importer. And there's the, like for, if you use tooling v2, you still have to use that. So in that case, it wouldn't actually be necessary anymore because the, the current template already uses the uh, v3. The other thing that changed is in the manifest. Well, let's just format it so you can better have a look. So what changed here? Um, we are in a Fury Elements application and I want to have a, made a little extension. I just uh, implemented the button here. Um, that's it, it just executes some code. And then because I'm using a component, I have to define the component, what's actually the name. So you can have a look here, that's like the component usage, I gave it a name. And then in the name is the namespace from the component I want to use. And there's also the version in there as well. And because we are using an in-app, I have to tell with resource roots where the component actually is. And it's in the third party folder or custom uh, control folder here. And the last thing we need is the, the controller. And again, as simple as possible, we have just like I said, a busy indicator and then use the create component, use the name and have a context is the only mandatory uh, option I need. Because if I know the context, I know the view. And if I know the view, I know every control is there. And from the list report is only one table. And with a table, I can access the binding and I can access all the metadata I need. So that's all I need to upload the data when I have the data because I can just use the standard APIs. The other option is not mandatory, but it's useful for the list report because when, I up, when you upload list report uh, data, we are in the V4, so draft. So if you would upload them, they wouldn't be activated. So you have to, would have to activate them manually one by one. So with that option, every single um, item will be automatically activated. All right. Let's just see how it looks like. And now you have there in the top right corner, a nice button spreadsheet upload. And when you uh, click that, you have a few options like download template. I showed that in a second. But I just want to upload now uh, some data. And you see it's like the top and the bottom. Those are the two, they're, they're, they're new and they are automatically activated. Now, when you go in the object page, would be nice to use them here as well. 
So let's just start the Yeoman generator as well. Again, in app. Now we want to go to the object page, which entity sets want to use in that kind of orders. Again, button text. Edit. And now in the background, it automatically reloaded and we have the button. Um, I added the option to only show the button when you're in edit mode. So if you go in edit mode, um, there's an error now. Because as I said, I'm looking at the whole view and I'm looking for a table. And right now, if you look at the table, there are two tables here. So I don't know which table you want to use. So that's why we have the option here as well to add the table. So I will add it now. So just edit here the, the table ID, and now my, con my component knows which table you want to upload the data from. So again, automatically uh, up, uh, refreshed. Now we can have a look at the template. So um, from the metadata I have, automatically the template will be generated. It's a little small, let's make it bigger. Oh, wait. So again, you uh, see in the top, um, is the, the label and then the squared brackets uh, the, the property name and that's how I know which data you want to upload. And then I add some sample data uh, just to make it easier uh, to input the data then. I prepare the sample file. Again, it's all good. There's a preview where you can have a look at the data which you're gonna upload. And because right now here you're in the, in the draft, it's not yet safe, but it's in the, in the draft tables. And now I can just press save and it's there. That's the happy path. Now the not so happy path would be like, okay, but it could be corrupt data, wrong data, anything. Um, and I will test what I know from the metadata. And if you have your metadata in mind, what's in there, like the, well, the basic thing is the data type. So I can actually check the data type and if you uh, want to upload something like that, and that's corrupt, it will, I will check every data type if that's valid. For example, at the, at the top quantity is an integer. And if you look at that, that's not an integer, there's some string in there. So that will dump. Um, I can check that before it goes to the back end. Um, then there's a wrong column test. It doesn't exist in the metadata, so it gives an error as well. Then all the dates, I can check the dates as well. They're clearly not correct. Okay. So that was pretty easy to set up. And how does that actually work? So there was a lot of talk about TypeScript. And of course, I developed everything in TypeScript. Is that... Big enough? Yeah. So the basis, as I said, is a component. So I used the, the UI component in that case. And you can see here, there's also the properties I uh, defined. There are some events to define, for example, check before read. So you can actually implement your own validation and add that to the error dialog dialogue that I just shown. Then I tried to use as much to, to modularize uh, or what I do, like the parser. And the parser, I pass actually the raw data I get from SheetJS and try to parse it. And if something goes wrong, I can uh, show the error message. There's a logger um, uh, because between v4 and v2, there are quite a few differences. So I used uh, an abstract class for OData and extended for v2 and before. So I can have some common methods and then uh, where some special cases for v2 or v4, I can actually um, extend that. Then um, there is, obviously I, I talked about um, the sheet.js. So we have, um, a great tool, what's called your five tooling uh, modules. And that's the best way currently to uh, implement something external libraries. And that's uh, what Peter actually developed. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the UI5 tooling modules, I think that's a pretty Im interesting extension to the UI5 tooling itself, because with the UI5 tooling modules, you can easily consume NPM packages. And um, basically, it's from an installation perspective also, it's very easy to install. Um, it's an NPM package, UI5 tooling modules, which is centrally available. And um, if you add this to your project, you immediately will be able to consume um, potential third-party packages. Like, for example, we used that at the last UL, UI5Con to showcase how easy you can embed chart.js. Or before in the TypeScript um, workshop, we had um, integrated denominator. It's an API to consume some um, yeah, wind information um, for a location. And, um, with that, with that plugin, if you if you add that to your um, yeah to your project, it's as simple as is. It's a it's a task. You don't need any configuration for that. You just plug that in, and uh, there is also um, a middleware available for that to um, convert these uh, files into a UI five module. And how does it work uh, from a technical point of view? I think, Mayan, you have built that project, yeah, right? Just the, top, yeah. the dist folder here. And um, you are using one special option, which is also pretty interesting if it comes to later deployment of your application. It's the add to namespace option. And with this add to namespace option, the UI5 tooling modules does one important thing. It copies this dependency into your local application namespace. And here, this sheet.js, is now in this third party folder. So all this, um, yeah, this third party files will go there. Um, and what happens is also that it's being, uh, let's maybe use the debug variant here, um, that it's adding here a boilerplate code for UI5. So all these modules are now a UI5 AMD like modules by having this SAP UI5 uh, defined syntax. Um, and the rest inside is all transpiled in a way that it can be consumed at runtime by UI5 easily. Um, so now if you deploy that, then just put it inside and the place is where you reference that. So I forgot um, where it exactly was. Was it here, the dialogue? Do you remember that? Uh, yeah. This one? Would you? Just find it quickly. I need the build output, spreadsheet upload dialog. So maybe the build output, maybe we can see yeah. it here. Here you have the source code as Mayan showed this import. Um, here it's still XLSX. This will be converted into a SAP UI define, which requires this module. But now in the build output, the spreadsheet upload dialog. So that's in the controller dialog section. So let me see that. Controller dialog, spreadsheet upload. So here we find that the namespace is rewritten. And this is the trick at the end, how this gets seamless in. So really, if you are using third-party files, use npm install with the third-party itself, use this plugin and use the option add to namespace because with that, it gets copied into your folder and you can make use of that just directly without adopting anything. And having TypeScript, you also benefit then from code completion support, what um, you see then here inside. And uh, basically, that's it. What I want to show quickly to that, and back to you. Yeah. So again, uh, come back to the theme. Make it as easy as possible, because when we implemented it in our sample app, we didn't use the UI5 tooling modules because using add to namespace, it just ships with the component, and the developer doesn't have to worry about the XLX to import or anything. Just uh, use the component. And that's that's a good part of that. Uh, it's a really common theme because the next theme is using uh, docs. Because if you write docs, there's probably the last part of the project. And that's what I did. Or I tried to, to write the docs as soon as possible. So they're quite comprehensive now. Um, if, you, if the theme looks familiar, I, I stole that from the UR5 tooling team so that they have the same theme. Um, I just took the, the, the setup. And when you 
look on, on the left, there's like many points I already covered. And for example, getting started, um, that's just the thing I, I just showed you. Um, it's really simple, just npm install, resource routes, if you use it as an in-app deployment, um, then the, the component usages, and then start with your Fury elements because it is a, uh, extensions, so you can use it, uh, write it yourself, or use guided development. So um, even Fury tools support you on that. And then just the basic uh, how it works. So actually, was what I'm going to tell you right now. And then a configuration. So every single uh, every single configuration option is here mentioned. Like context is the only mandatory one. Then um, events with some sample codes, so how to use the samples. For example, here's the, um, the custom check. For example, um, here's the check to check the price if it's not over 100. Um, and then you can see here that's with the, with the custom, custom error, like price is too high. And that's in the same dialogue if there are any other errors as well. Then again, error handling. Um, there is one option to set mandatory fields. So for example, if you have mandatory fields, they, they should be in the Excel file that's gonna be checked as well. But again, I'm using metadata. So why not use the metadata? And there's one annotation that's called mandatory field, and I can use that as well. So if you, you, if you check the mandatory annotation in the backend, I'm gonna use it and check if that field is gonna be in the Excel file. Then again, TypeScript, um, I developed a sample app because I'm, I'm testing as well on the sample app as well on TypeScript. Um, and to just show the, the config, how to set it up. And because I'm using the, the interface generator and everything what uh, Peter and Andreas developed, I can actually ship the types with the component and you can use them uh, here inside. So for example, there's a, a custom event. So when I showed you the events, there's a check before read, and then you can use that type in your app with a component. So that's a great approach if you rolling out TypeScript uh, and have custom libraries, you can actually ship TypeScript types with the library when you're using that uh, library in your, in, your, in your app. Then again, we want to support a lot of uh, versions. So that's why I created a lot of uh, sample apps and created a lot of VDI 5 tests and OPA tests. I'll come to them in a second. Then explain the central uh, deployment. I offered a, a deploy YAML, how do you can deploy that in your system. Shortly, briefly explain the, the Yeoman generator. Then I have a, a button control. So if you don't want to use it via code, you can just drop in the button control in your, for example, freestyle app. You don't need to set up uh, the component via code. Then I explained a little bit about the, the setup, the getting started in development. I offer a, a, a button called open in GitHub code spaces. So if you press that, there's a ready-made uh, development environment. I made a troubleshooting guide. There's a special debug tool where a lot of um, console messages are gonna be put out. So I could deploy, uh, debug it easier. It's really simple user documentation and use cases, um, which was written by ChatGPT. Um, Every session is ChatGPT. Yeah? <laughs> I thought about how to implement. Can you can pass CVS files with ChatGPT? No, no. Um, all right. Um, I briefly mentioned testing. Let's go back to testing because again. Um, I want to support as many versions as possible. So I, let's go just quickly back to, to that page. And as you can see, there are uh, a lot of green hooks. So it's working great. But if you have worked with uh, VDI 5 before, um, you have one base config, you have specs, and you can just... Um, use basically one URL. So I have a lot of tests for all maintenance versions, current, current maintenance version, just ignore 38. I don't count that. And 
for V4 and V2. For example, in uh, V2, I use a list report draft, list report non-draft, object page draft, object page non-draft, freestyle application for that. And you can even use open UFI freestyle because I use just components which are present in uh, open, UF, uh, open UR5, except for draft activation. Um, that's unfortunately not in open UR5. <laughs> and for before, I have also sample apps for list reports draft, where there's no non-draft. Um, I didn't write yet freestyle tests or flexible programming tests, but I have a sample app, so it works. Um, I have tests for TypeScript, and I have a test for the CDS plugin, which uh, Tobias showed this morning. So how could I approach this to not rewrite every single test and again and again? So first step, I want to have all those apps for every version. So I wrote just the basic app uh, in version 108. So if you go into the GitHub, uh, GitHub repo, there's like all these packages. And if you look closely, like there are some, they are a bit grayed out because they are added to Git ignore because they are not in the GitHub repo. I just wrote, for example, the top one is orders v2 fe, so that's order data v2 fewer elements, and that's version 108. And now I wrote a script to just copy um, that app to a different version. So. What I change is mostly just a minimal version here in the beginning. And then in the, uh, here, I just replace the port number. Because in theory, I want to execute them all side by side. And to, to like host all this data, I have a JSON file, which just uh, saves all the most important information like the root app name, like the app description, the port number, what the namespace is, where is the app located, what's the minor version, and what kind of specs do this uh, app actually uses. Now, I have this information. Um, and if you know VDR5, there's like this base config. And this base config is a JavaScript file. So, Let's just use JavaScript in that file. Um, so I did that. And you can see here in line 14, I just get the information with the scenario. So scenario is basically orders v2 fe and the version like 108, 96. And then I get the, the specs and the port. And that information I can just put here in this uh, VDA5 config file. And there's just one, one exception is for the, the CDS plugin because there's a different um, URL. So now I can start the test for every single scenario and every single version I have. And I do that also because I want to automate that. And that's, uh, the code is in GitHub anyway, so I use GitHub Actions and I have a workflow to test that. So um, to make that easy as well, to not have a workflow for every single version, I use something called matrix. And the matrix basically executes for every scenario and every version. So multiplied by that. So yes, orders v2 fe, v4 uh, Fury elements, v2 non-draft, OpenUR5, TypeScript, and CDS plugin. There are a few exceptions, for example, in v4.71. And TypeScript and CDS, I only test currently 108. So now I have these variables, and I can use them to start my app. Like here, because in the package JSON, it's just um, the scenario name and the version. So I can start with PMPM, start the app. And in the next, I can just wait till the server is there. So cup is for, for 004. I wait till the app is there. So I can use the, the variable test port as, as well. Here's on here. That's the name from the package JSON where the VDR5 tests are. And I can just use this scenario in year five version. And now 
I just have to execute this test. And when we go to the GitHub page, have a look at the actions. Oh, that's the wrong one. That was a test. Now here you can see, not really clear, but you can tell those are all the tests for every single version, every single scenario. So here's the matrix, and matrix executes all of them, and they are all green. Cool. Uh, that's how it should be, uh, should be. So that's really try to, to make it as easy as possible for me to not rewrite every single time. And I also use for um, V2 and V4, I also use the same specs because the only difference actually is the IDs from the, from the controls. Because I often use the IDs just to make my life a little bit easier. And I can just use here from the object, uh, the ID, and get the, the uh, control in VDR5 tests. So that's how I used to set up the, the testing. Next problem I had was with um, components and libraries is I saw that a lot of customers is when you write a library, it should be reused as often as possible because you don't want to rewrite every single like, utility function. Um, what I saw was that um, after time, library gets bigger and bigger. Nobody wants to touch the library because they're like, this function used by 100 apps. So I don't want to touch it because when I touch it, I have to, use, I have to test all those 100 apps. So I brainstormed with Peter about the solution and came up with the, the version and the namespace. So Peter, you would like to show the, the basic setup for them. Yeah, I think I can show that. We have a small test project for that. You open that. Thank you. So then let's look a little bit in this test project. So the challenge, what Marian described, was that um, he wants to make the same component available with a different in different versions. And the only way to do that so far is that we have different namespaces and add the version into the namespace of it. Um, a component. So if we look, for example, in the, in the UI5 YAML, we see that also how this can look like. So we have here this com my org my app v3, <laughs> and this should be a dynamic namespace so that only in one place of my component I maintain that. Um, relevant for the build and for the test run of the application is this UI5 build. So this is really in rough that what uh, Marian did in a bigger scale on, on his project. But here it, it visualizes a little bit more. And what we are doing with that namespace is that we are using the string replace, so also something which comes from the community a plugin, like the tooling modules. It's a task. And this task is rewriting then all placeholders with dollar namespace dollar with the value which is maintained in that central place above. The same we have also in the middleware. So if you develop that, that it's also being replaced with that. And now in all source code files of the application itself, like the index HTML, there is no namespace hard written. So we have here the dollar namespace dollar, or here in the UI component, we have the dollar namespace dollar in the extent of the component. In TypeScript, it would be in this um, yeah, comment on top that you have this dollar namespace dollar. So everywhere where this namespace is used, it's just using this dynamic part. And then you can run, it's running already or it's built. Run that quickly. Ah. <laughs> That's my port, usually. Let's use 8081. So this is the application, which is used here. So I'm quickly looking into the network trace, what's happening, that's no big magic. But in the index HTML, we see in the response that now all the placeholders for sure are replaced. And there is a nice thing as well, if you do that consistently and uh, in that project, 
then you can even remove that while development uh, while developing um, this transfer uh, this this middleware this string replacer middleware and get rid of that because when the dollar namespace dollar is consistent then it can also work with this namespace so now if i have the index html then i see cache should be cleared for sure i do have disable cache is not turned on And now it uses dollar namespace dollar inside. And as we have it consistently there, it's it's useful. And with that, we now have a complete freedom, more or less, of the application for the namespace and can decide at a later, later point of time when we build that. And if you run then npm run build, the task does again the trick to inject the namespace then properly again in all the files, like here the index HTML file or the component that let's lose the debug, it's better to read. And then we have with that really a, a component which has a version inside. And this component can be staying stable. And the next time you increase the version, you have a new namespace with a new version, which can be used then aside in the same context. So if you run, for example, the Fiori Launchpad or so, you have two applications with different, two the similar applications with different namespace available. And you can make use in one application the, with the, the one version and the other application with the other version. And with that, we achieved that, yeah, your requirement is being addressed and you could then continue to have multiple versions not changing the app. So that's what I want to show here. This project um, is also available on uh, my GitHub user. So github.com, uh, Peter Music, and UI5 version namespace. So that's a little breakdown where you can test that as well. Thanks, Peter. That's just uh, the visualization of how you, how you could you do, do that. So different apps use just different versions so you can update it and don't have to test them individually. So in our uh, title was open source. Why did I use open source? Um, one big point was there's a lot of new approaches. Like I didn't see any tutorial about how do I develop a, cust uh, a component in TypeScript. I have this requirement about namespaces. Like it made my life so much easier because I could ask a lot of uh, other people. Like if you have a look in the community, there's often like this comment, we can't help you because you don't show us any code at all. So how can we help you? So I have this, like in the beginning, I had a problem with Cup and I asked a question in the community and here Oliver Clemens did not just provide the answer. He provided a pull request and he fixed my app so that's really a big, big point about using open source because everyone can to, can contribute. Or when I ask questions in, in other um, GitHub repositories, for, for example, UR5 tooling, I had a, a problem and it was closed pretty quickly. And I could just say, yeah, git clone PMP uh, install and run PM run. So make it the life easier for those who want to debug my, my app as well. And the same, I had a problem with VDI-5, the same, like just get clone. I made a special branch, just check out PMBM, run start and run the test. And then you get the same error I got. So it made the life so much easier for the VDI-5 contributors. And my, you can see here as well, it's already closed and it fixed my problem. Um, and of course, a lot of contributors. So that was, that was, Update. Maybe because of the time is over, <laughs> and they immediately skipped them. Okay, ah, uh, I lost network. Interesting. Okay, but my, maybe we can just um, yeah do okay, it. Okay, I, I read the the file. Um, so what what I wanted to say in 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 the end is um, why did I use open source? Because I want to make it. As easy as, possible, as easy as possible for myself and others. And like as easy as possible is when others use it. So I wanted to keep the, the barrier as low as possible. As you saw, I wrote, uh, I wrote good documentation, at least I think so. I provided a, a live demo where you can even immediately test how that works. Um, I can't show the QR code where that works. Uh, but, um, but the slides will be uploaded. Yeah. yeah and make it easy set up. Like I said, just saw a second ago, like git clone npm install and make it easy as possible. 
use a Jemen, Jemen generator, like a lot of people are heard, heard already using it. And then we use standard tools, like use tooling modules, use string replacer. I, I use a lot of them um, just to make my life easier because other people contributing to GitHub as well. So if there are questions, for sure, now we have five minutes or roughly five minutes for, um, yeah, feel free to, to ask. I will jump around. I give you the microphone. Oh, then I run. The question is nevertheless for you. <laughs> uh, so you showed that the, you were able to retrieve the metadata from the table ID. Is it also possible to only give you the model and the, the entity? So like outside of the furry element context so that we not use the uh, the metadata driven table but only use the metadata for the excel upload yeah of course like i already thought about it. you you basically just need to, the services you want to consume yeah. like i think there is an odata service where you can just query every other service you have and then it can just choose the other service and upload the data there as well of course, like that's what I need. I need the APIs and the binding. And if I have that, I can use everything. And one other question in your direction regarding the the tooling task for the um, for the modules. It's uh, in the same direction that you solved with the versioning in the in the namespace. So when we use that module, is it that the uh, that, for example, chart.js will go into the window namespace, or will this stay in a separate context and will only use it will only be used inside the application? So basically, it doesn't go into the namespace of the of the window. Um, only if the library leaks that for sure. If the library does something like exporting it to the global window object, then this may happen. Um, but typically, um, this is really isolated. It's part of the module's namespace then only. And with that, you get it only when you import it as a dependency. It's private. Yeah, it's like, it's an AMD module. Exactly. The, it, that's why I called it AMD-like module, because UI5 has this own syntax of SAP UI define and uh, SAP UI require for, instead of define and require. Exactly. It's not even every library this, which is AMD conform. You can load every library. It will be converted into an AMD-like module. That's roll-up logic behind the scenes. So this bundles that in a in a proper way that you have it. And yeah, it gets just wrapped exactly. Yeah, and then you can use it like a regular UI5 module. That's the trick, and that's the, really the benefit of that. More questions? for one yeah. last question. I run. Yeah. What's the reason um, you use the global action on the, let's say, on the object page and not the uh, table action? Because then I get issues if I want to implement two actions. Yeah. Uh, uploads, it, right? It's on my task list to change that because I used the global from the beginning and I didn't change that. But obviously it makes sense to make it more on the table. Unfortunately, that would be great if it's on the table. I already know the table. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. You still have, if you have more than one table, you have to define the table ID. But yes, you're right. It would be more make more sense to to put it directly on the on the table. Okay. Yeah. Then thanks for having us. Thanks for joining. Enjoy. <laughs>